Thank you, Del LaBelle and Mike Page. And Del, I really like your backdrop there. We, I, I'd love to learn how you got that and use it myself. Uh, our next panel looks at the need for patient engagement and health equity. Dr. Frank McCormick is professor of internal medicine at the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine. Kelly Maynard is founder of Little, Her the Little Hercules Foundation. You heard me mention it earlier. She launched the foundation after her youngest son was diagnosed with the rare disease Duchenne muscular dystrophy at the age of five. And Dr. Frida Lewis Hall is a patient health equity advocacy and a advocate and a former chief medical officer at Pfizer. I always love talking to Frida. Frida, it's great seeing you again uh, and having you here. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, let me just start with Dr. McCormick. Um, we're going to be interviewing, I, I've already had the conversation actually, but I have, have a, a conversation uh, in a while with Sarah Bacon. Uh, and Sarah uh, has a, is a uh, person who suffers with Lyme disease. It's a rare disease. And, and Dr. Uh, McCormick, I know that you uh, have put much of your life into this community of rare disease. And I'd love to know from you and have our parent, you know, uh, have our viewers listen to you, you know, as someone who's been a practitioner or researcher, you know, offered therapies in this area, headed the foundation. What's gone well in dealing with this, this segment of rare disease? What isn't going well? Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, uh, have been involved with the foundation since 1995, uh, and this community of patients came together uh, under the uh, direction of a mother who, whose daughter was diagnosed with Lamb about that time, uh, and she uh, was able to uh, gather the trust of hundreds of patients with a disease that ended up supporting some early research that provided the foundation for clinical trials and ultimately led to a, uh, an approved therapy for, for LAM over the course of about 20 years. Uh, and I'd say the things that have gone well are that uh, patient engagement drove the whole process. Uh, we had great help from many directions, including pharma and from uh, the FDA and from physician scientists around the world. Uh, and ultimately, the, the key to finding the treatment was patients who were willing to enroll in trials and take risk. You know, at the time that this drug, it became obvious that this drug had great promise in LAM, any one of these patients could have gone to their own physicians, gotten a prescription written, and taken the drug off label. Um, but I think the community realized the benefit of proving for all time that this drug was going to be uh, useful in LAM uh, really carried the day. And in the end, these patients signed up for two years of being randomized to either a placebo or a drug, uh, not knowing which they're receiving, while their lung function declined at the rate of about 10% per year. So it, in the end, it's tremendous courage on the parts of patients that, that really made this happen. And, and, and before I jump to our other guests, um, Dr. McCormick, you know, I guess the question I have is, you know, I, that, that had been my experience, too. I would sort of meet these heroes, you know, who've moved forward research, who've helped raise money, who've kind of, you know, it, you know, I've used this a couple of times, you know, like, you know, Horton hears a who. It's like we're here, we're here and we matter. But I'm just interested in how we move beyond the need for people to be. I, I'm going to get this wrong. I love heroes. But. Should we be depending on heroism of patients to do this? What are the structural deficits in our research and approach to rare diseases that, from your insights, you think we have an opportunity to fix? Well, there, there are, there's a lot of innovation in, in trial design that might uh, obviate the need for randomized clinical trials in some situations, but it's, there, it's very hard to improve upon randomized clinical trials for proving that a therapy works. And uh, it's just a hard fact of life. And it, it, it ends up, I think, falling to the patients to uh, you know, sort of um, get the courage and, and, and enroll in these studies um, uh, to, to prove that these therapies work. Um, you know, my, my hope is in the future, there'll be ways to do this without having to randomize patients to a therapy or a, a, a placebo, but uh, I, I don't know a way forward at this point. Well, thank you. Well, Kelly Maynard, um, I mentioned you earlier as part of what I saw as a very positive element of, you know, that there's infrastructure. I had no idea that there was a rare disease advisory council to the governor of Ohio. That's terrific, right? And you're a member of that. Um, your life changed with your son's diagnosis. Uh, I read uh, a bit of your story. And I guess I've always had this, 
um, I don't know, insecurity in talking about this to a certain degree. When I hear that people who are suffering from something, they become the champions, just like Dr. McCormick said, they get involved and raise the money. So there are people like me who want to be allies. How best to be an ally? How best to you know, bring other people along so it's not just family members of your son that are moving forward, it's other members of the community. Is that a fair question? That absolutely is, and thank you for having me, and thank you for um, asking the question. Uh, I think there are many ways to support uh, rare disease patients and organizations. First, um, you know, one critical step towards getting approved treatments is making sure that we have organized and, um, uh, you know, robust advocacy um, representation. And so that's critically important. We have to know how to get to patients, um, regardless if the disease affects 20,000 patients, 100,000 patients, or 100 patients. So that's step number one. Um, donating money is, you know, moms like us are constantly raising money. Um, and so that's a, a great way to, um, you know, propel the science forward. We have, um, you know, many of the treatments that are um, in the development pipeline and are approved um, started because we funded that, you know, we gave seed funding to these really smart researchers that were wanting to um, develop a cure. And we were able to de-risk that so companies could come in and commercialize those treatments. And now we have four approved treatments to treat Duchenne that are mutation specific. So they treat about 31% of our disease population and that um, we just saw our first approval in 2016. So it definitely wow. works. Well, wow. I just um, just last week I interviewed uh, a woman, also a mom, uh, who who has a son with uh, two genetic uh, disorders that and, and one is the Prader Willi syndrome. Um, and and I just you know asked her, I said, can you share with someone who's sort of taken such an active role in structurally with this rare disease, what's your life? And you know, she would say th they were constantly traveling because of having to see certain specialists, and you know, completely disrupted their lives. And so, I guess you know, a question I would love our audience to know is, can you convey to to our our audience what it what it is like to be the support network of someone who's suffering from rare disease? Yeah, I mean, I think we all can relate. You know, you've heard several times today, there are over 7,000 rare diseases, um, the large majority of which are uh, genetic in nature um, and affect about one in 10 of us in America. So <clears throat> we have all those, those diseases are very different and varied. Um, the common thing that we have is that, um, you know, we're all fighting the, the time clock, right? And so, and we've been doing it since diagnosis day. And so um, there are a lot of similarities in, in our lives. And um, I've had moms say to me, you know, I, and dads, um, they, they take one day a week to just complete phone calls and call in prescription refills. One whole day a week is just made, um, is, is set aside to coordinate care on behalf of their loved one. Um, I, I think we can do better with caregiver support in, in this country. Um, and, and COVID has shined a, a bright light on that, right? Um, for those living with rare diseases that are disabling in nature and um, require home health aids, hmm. we lost all of that help during COVID. And so we, have, we had to basically become skilled nurses on top of everything else, you know, and taking care of um, our other children and working. And so I would love to see us improve caregiver support and, and improve efforts for rare disease patients who are traveling um, across state lines. Um, we can do better with coverage, with Medicaid coverage and coordinating Medicaid coverage. So um, there, there are lots of ways that we can um, do that, but we just have to make it a priority. It has to be important. Frida Lewis Hall, I remember we spoke, I think it was last year, and the big, the big thing going on then was COVID uh, uh, vaccine trials um, and the questions of inclusivity reaching broad communities all around. I can't imagine a more important topic as well to discuss um, than inclusivity in trials, but really inclusion 
uh, and diversity in, in research in the rare disease space, which, which throws in a layer of complexity and challenge. But would love to get your thought on how, I mean, how do we not gasp for air so much on this? How can we become more confident that baked in? And I got to tell people, from my understanding, it's not, particularly in this space, you know, thinking of the Little Hercules Foundation, it's not just, you know, ethnic diversity, it's, it's also age diversity. And, and I'm just surprised at how undiverse a lot of our trials are. But Frida, I'm sorry to you know, be giving your shtick, but you taught me a little bit. But you know, give us your thoughts. Well, you're doing a great job there. Thank you so much for getting, <laughs> getting us started in such a robust way, but you're absolutely right. The intersection between um, underserved communities, whether it be age, um, the level of advancement of a disease, for example, geography, there are a whole host of things that create um, a lack of diversity in the clinical trial environment. And we can and must do a better job at that. And there are a number of points that were made earlier that I think are, are really important. Um, the first is um, identifying those specific issues. Are there actually differences for communities that are underserved currently and need to be included that add the additional barriers? For example, access to uh, care. How do you, if getting diagnosed properly with um, a rare disease is difficult. Imagine being someone who is a minority who may not have access to general care, but in particular may not have access to a specific specialized care hmm. for that uh, disease. So those double downs, if you would, or pylons uh, become particularly different uh, or difficult. Um, the numbers are not good and are even worse in rare diseases. So if you think about racial and ethnic minority um, alone, 38% of the population, but only 16% representation in trials, we've got a pretty big uh, gap to fill. Um, I, I, Kelly mentioned that COVID had given us, um, had shined some light on it. My husband says people don't change when they see the light, they change when they feel the heat. Uh -huh. And COVID also provided some heat by showing us that particular communities um, need to be represented because medications may represent a different benefit to some community members over others, that inclusion in trials may have additional barriers, uh, socioeconomic status and others. And last but not least, some rare diseases are disproportionately represented by uh, different racial and ethnic groups. Duchenne mm. mus muscular dystrophy is a great example with an increased um, number of Hispanic young men being affected. Hmm. But you can go down a long list, sarcoidosis, sickle cell, beta thalassemia, some uh, types of lupus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the importance of inclusion in clinical trial is clearly there. I think the heat and the opportunity are also there for us to move forward with things like, um, and they were mentioned before, but I think I'll underscore, put an exclamation point, um, you know, changing the way in which we do trials to include um, remote monitoring, other forms of technology and mm. tools so that um, patients have access. Frida, um, you used to, I mean, there's this term in, in DC, it's, I, I never always worry about terms, um, but it uh, goes around for politically important people. You were a poobah at Pfizer, and you were a poobah frequently on Dr. Phil. So you were in these in very important spots, and now you're on Steve Clement's show on the Hill. Let me just ask you, talking about these subjects, do, in your gut, do you feel like we're moving in the wrong direction? How far do we go? What would you grade the overall health ecosystem on the inclusion front? I think we're doing better, but we have a ways to go. Some hmm. of it is building infrastructure, understanding the barriers better first, right? We make some assumptions right. about what the barriers are. This is where the patient's voice comes in, where we think the barrier is one thing, and it turns out that you have to ask patients and it may be a little bit different and we may have to have a number of solutions. So I think doing better listening, um, we're doing that and now are coming up with better solutions. Um, one of the pivotal points for me was uh, I was doing a talk on rare diseases and I kept saying patient engagement and patients are being engaged. And one of the advocates that was on the stage with me touched me on my knee. She said, honey, we've been engaged for a long time. It's time to be married. <laughs> and I think that we are married now. Oh, um, cool. And 
um, organizations wow. are partnering in tremendous ways. So we have uh, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences that has an entire spectrum of partnering work right. to help teach and uh, connect to get some of the work done. I could go on and on with the list of advancements for individual organizations and broad partnerships that are moving forward to address this. So I would say that I'm optimistic that we're moving down the road, but we got a little bit of ways to go still. Look, this is a fantastic conversation. Look, we're almost out of time, but I just feel like, you know, I'm often with members of Congress, both parties, Democrats, Republicans, hanging out, members of the administration, cabinet members, policy players. Um, I would like to ask each of you if you were to kind of give me a little one tidbit to share in that audience when I get the opportunity about this front. Give me, give me something to push. Dr. McCormick? Just that low, uh, these genetic rare lung diseases, rare diseases of all types, uh, have tremendous potential for advancement and early discovery because the clues are so rich. And it's a great investment. You can affect a, a lot of people in, in a short period of time in a very dramatic way. So I, I think it's, a, it's very important for Congress to focus on these rare illnesses that we have a potential, the potential to, to cure. What a great suggestion, and I, I will do my best with that. Uh, Kelly McCormick, uh, I'm sorry, Kelly Maynard? Uh, support Cures 2.0, support the STAT Act. And uh, as Dr. Frieda mentioned, um, we've, we've come a long way. Um, we're seeing, a wa we're witnessing a watershed moment with medical innovation right now. But that innovation means absolutely nothing if we can't get those treatments to every single patient that is eligible to receive them. And so innovation can't stop at approval. We have to keep going. We have to improve mm. payer engagement. Um, we have too many people speaking on the burden of disease that aren't rare disease patients. That should never happen. Mm. The only thing worse than having no treatment approved for a disease as a patient or as a, a parent is having a drug approved and not being able to get access to it. So that would be uh, the next push that we, we really need to fight for as patients. Terrific. And Frida Lewis Hall. Frida? I have to do a little bit of pile on with Kelly to say, <laughs> um, yeah, so having Star Wars medicine, but a Flintstones accent um, does not work. I think we um, have tremendous um, explosive Frida, I have science, to interrupt. And we need I, to make you, did, sure to get it there. I, I have to interrupt. Did you just say having a Star Wars medicine with Flintstones access? I just love both. Yes. Bo okay, great. <laughs> I'm going to steal that, Dr. Frida. I'm going to steal that. I mean, that's, a, so that's, called, a, that's called a tweetable <laughs> so, moment, folks. I mean, so we need Star in, case Wars my, uh, in case our team is watching this and writing about this today, that is, that is definitely a line. <laughs> you know? Anyway, I'm, please finish because I just, I just had to make sure I had that right. Go ahead, Frida. No, I, I think it's very important for us to, um, to continue to spawn the kinds of partnerships and um, structure, infrastructure that allows us to move things forward for, um, faster. Well, listen, I want to thank you. What a wonderful, I think, impactful and consequential conversation. Dr. Frank McCormick, a professor of inter internal medicine at the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine. Kelly Maynard, founder of the Little Hercules Foundation. And Dr. Frida Lewis Hall, the former chief medical officer at Pfizer uh, and a patient health advocate. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. Bye.